lesson from the first letter of St. Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. Brethren, you know that when you were Gentiles, you went to dumb idols according to as you were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God says anathema to Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of workings, but the same God, who works all things in all. Now the manifestation of the Spirit is given to everyone for profit. To one, through the Spirit, is given the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith in the same Spirit. To another, the gift of healing in the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the distinguishing of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. But all these things are the work of the one and the same Spirit, who allots to everyone according as he will. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to Luke. At that time, Jesus spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves as being just and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and began to pray thus within himself, O God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men, robbers, dishonest, adulterers, or even like this publican. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I possess. But the publican, standing afar off, would not so much as lift up his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his breast, saying, O God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went back to his home justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. Saving words of the Gospel. Please kneel for your prayer for vocations. Let us ask God to give worthy priests, brothers and sisters to his holy church. O God, we earnestly beseech thee to bless this diocese with many priests, brothers and sisters who will love thee with their whole strength and gladly spend their entire lives to serve thy church and to make thee known and loved. Bless our families, bless our children. Mary, Queen of the Clergy. There are the following announcements. Save the date. Saturday, September 28th at 6 p.m. for a fun-filled evening of trivia, music, food, drinks, and prizes at St. Mary Pine Bluff Gym. See the bulletin for more information. The Parish Finance Council has approved a continuation of the Catholic Schools Scholarship Program for the 2019-2020 school year. The availability of the funds and final approval of the requests will be made by the Finance Council. I'd remind you that anybody who has something uh, you would like to have blessed, uh, please come back to the sacristy uh, directly after Mass, and I will be happy to bless those things for you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Reverend Deacon, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the Gospel reading today brings the Lord's own teaching about the attitude with which we are to pray. The Holy Mother Church is a wise mother, and she knows that we need certain repetition of things for our well-being. Therefore, she repeats this parable to us on a yearly basis. This is a great advantage in the classical, traditional Roman Mass, with its ancient formularies that we've been play, praying the same order at the same time of year for centuries and centuries, going all the way back to even before the time of St. Gregory the Great. 
who died in the early seventh century. And think about all the people, all our forebears, who year in and year out have been nourished by these same readings that we have the opportunity to hear. The repetition makes sure that we understand them. Every year we are a little different. The readings don't change, but we do. And so we apprehend them in a different way every time we hear them. So our parable's message is really fairly simple. We've all sinned and we are beggars before God, so we beg mercy from God. And, but we are able to beg with confidence. Uh, one of the things about the publican, he acknowledges himself to be a sinner. He humiliates himself, humbles himself before God, but he didn't stay away from the temple. He went to the temple to pray. He did not stay away, he went. Which is an important lesson for us. We mustn't stay away from God. Even if we perceive ourselves to have sinned in some way, never stay away from God. We should go to him like the publican did. He went up to the temple. Well, we don't stay away either. We go to the confessional. We can be lowly in recognizing who we are as sinners, but we can still be confident. We believe in God's promises. He'll forgive us if we ask for forgiveness. This is how we are to be humble confident but not presumptuous, brutally honest with ourselves, and in awe of God's justice and his undeserved mercy. But it's, it's a mysterious thing about the Christian character. It's, it's possible to be abject in sorrow and yet overflowing with joy because we know who we are, but we know who God is. Is it possible to be hollowed out and empty and yet full of faith, hope, and love? Yes, absolutely it is. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is precisely the attitude of the repentant sinner as God washes clean his upraised and offered soul. So our parable is repeated every year. But in every Mass we are also reminded of the same attitude the same attitude of prayer, especially around the time of the offertory prayers. Uh, this is a section of the Mass that strikes me in particular as a priest when I pray these things. The prayers of the priest are very introspective. And you can make them your own. Remember that you are baptized. You share in Christ's priesthood in your own way, not in the way that I do, but in your own way. Your sharing by baptism in the priesthood of our Lord makes it possible for you to offer offerings, sacrifices, petitions, and so forth to the Lord, which are pleasing. You participate in his priesthood. And so when you see the offertory taking place, you should pay attention to the prayers of the priest. Follow in your missal. Follow in your book. Think about what they mean. Remember that, that you join yourself to those prayers. Join yourself to what the priest is doing. You know, one of the things that we have that I think about when I look at these prayers is how the older form of mass, the traditional mass, control keeps the priest under control and tells him who he is and who he isn't. For example, the rubrics actually tell us to look down when we are on our way in and look down when we turn to say Dominus Obiscum. Why? Well, because it's not about us. All this looking out, I think, has maybe sent a lot of wrong messages to a lot of people. We get to sit sideways, for example, not out facing you. We are not in control. This is not about us. When we do get to look at someone, we get to look at ourselves through the contents of the prayers because the content of the prayers are constantly telling us how unworthy we are. We priests, when we are at the altar, are reminded at every Mass in the traditional rite, not so much in the newer form, that God does not cho choose those who are worthy, but those whom it pleases Him to choose. We are constantly being told that we are sinners, and we are unworthy, and only God makes it possible for us to be up there. 
Now consider the order of the prayers of the offertory. This is a, the offertory is a, comes from the Latin word ofero, and this is the time when we put our oblations on the altar. Oblation is a word that comes from the third principal part of the Latin verb ofero. You might have heard the word oblate. An oblate is someone who offers himself uh, to God, usually uh, in relationship to some, for example, Benedictine monastery. He becomes like a third order, third, a member of, of the order in an indirect way. He remains a layman staying in the world, but uh, he's offered himself in a special way. So it becomes an oblate that's related to the word ofro, to offer, to offer oneself. This is what happens at Holy Mass, of course. The priest takes what God has given us, the hosts and the host in the ciborium, and he raises these things up, the wine with the water in it, raises them up, asking God to prepare them for transubstantiation. He raises his eyes up to God, and then he casts them down. He's absolutely directed to look up and then look down to remind himself of his lowly status at the altar. The content of the prayers tells us that he is offering the sacrifice first for himself because he needs the needs what God has to give so much and then for everyone else there and then also for all of the living and the dead. You may have followed these prayers in your hand missiles, your booklets. I encourage you to do so. Here's what the priest says. Accept, O Holy Father, Almighty, Eternal God, this unspotted host, which I, thy unworthy servant, offer unto thee, my living and true God, for my innumerable sins and offenses and negligences, and for all here present, and for all faithful Christians, both living and dead, that it may avail both me and them for salvation unto life everlasting. Amen. That's what he says when he holds up the, the host and the patent. You know, when we pray, it's okay to use set prayers because they can lead us to deeper forms of prayer. They can get us ready to do more. Never be afraid to use set prayers when you pray. You can even take things from the Missal and use them. So the priest raises the, offers up the host on the patent. Then he gives the patent to the subdeacon. This is something every once in a while people will ask me about. The subdeacon hides it under the, the humeral veil. He stands there before the altar. A humeral veil. Humeral comes from the Latin word for shoulders because it goes over his shoulders. One explanation of the hiding of the patent under the veil at the solemn mass is because the divine nature of our Lord was hidden uh, during his passion, the people around him didn't recognize. They didn't know what the, they didn't know what they were doing, as our Lord said. There were very few who recognized it. That in that terrible moment, of course, his mother knew. The centurion came to recognize who he was. Surely this is the Son of God. The good thief came to recognize it. So the subdeacon stands there as a still and silent witness to the awesome event of Calvary. And he holds the patent up in front of his eyes so that he can't see the sacrifice. Sometimes I've been thought I've think thought about this over the years and he has the veil in the patent almost like the you remember what happened to Saul when Saul was struck down by a flash of light by our Lord and interrogated, why are you persecuting me? And he had, it was a veil over his vision. He became blind. And later on, it was, he said, as it was if the, the veil removed, the scales fell from his eyes. Sometimes I think about the humeral veil and the, the pattern like that a little bit. If I can embroider that theme just a moment uh, with the contemporary news that we've been hearing about the Pew research, about the number of Catholics who do not believe in the teaching of the Eucharist. 
maybe we can do something with this image of the subdeacon standing before the altar with the pattern up before his eyes so he isn't, he isn't seeing the altar. You might see this hymn as a stand-in for all Catholics today who do not believe what the Church teaches about the Eucharist. The truth is right in front of their face, but it's hidden from their eyes. So when you see the deacon standing there, pray to, pray to St. Paul that the scales and the veils fall from their eyes and that they come to know and accept the truth about what the Church teaches. St. Albert the Great explains in another way that the chalice will symbolize the tomb and the patent, the stone before the tomb, and the linen corporals, and so forth, the shrouds. There are all sorts of beautiful explanations for this. Each one of these different tracks of thought can lead you more deeply into the offertory. But what, moving on, though, the priest or the deacon then prepares the chalice by putting a tiny bit of water in it, which is symbolic of our humanity, humble water, our humanity being taken into the wine, a symbol of how our Lord took our humanity into an indestructible bond with his divinity. Once that water goes in, it's, can't be, it can't be extracted again. It's that indestructible bond. The second person took our humanity into that bond so that he could, in turn, share the benefits of divinity with us, and saving us from our sins and receiving us into heaven. And so at that moment, the, prayer, the priest says, O oh God, who in creating human nature didst wonderfully dignify it and still more wonderfully restore it, grant that by the mystery of this water and wine we may be made partakers of his divine nature who vouchsafed to be made a partaker of our human nature, even Jesus Christ our Lord thy Son, who with thee liveth and reigneth in the unity of the Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. That prayer goes back to St. Ambrose, who died at the end of the 4th century. He died in 397. To put the water in to the chalice, you want to put just a little tiny bit of water in because you don't want to dilute the wine to endanger in any way that you don't have the right substance to be transformed at the consecration. So you put in just a little bit, just a few drops, sometimes... In places like here, you'll see a little spoon used. It's called a scruple spoon, not because we have scruples or uh, we're anxious about something, overly anxious about it. A scruple is actually a unit of measure that we don't use very much anymore, but apothecaries used to use it all the time. So this scruple, this little spoon is just enough for like a single scruple. So you use a couple of couple of little drops of water. That's all there is. Sometimes when you pour the wine or pour the water in, there will be a little there's a little splashing, little little drops on the side of the chalice. There's one one spiritual tradition. I don't remember who it is. I think it might be Gregory the Great, who says that the wiping of those little droplets that have kind of escaped around the inside of the chalice are like the clearing away of those who do not believe in what we're doing. They have no business there next to what is about to be transformed. And so we clear the little droplets away because they're not to be there at this awesome mystery. So then the priest holds up the chalice with water and the wine and he, he prays, we offer unto thee, O Lord, the chalice of salvation, beseeching thy clemency, that it may ascend before thy divine majesty as a sweet savor for our salvation and for that of the whole world. So even then we're begging mercy, we're begging his, the priest is begging his clemency, clemency. And that sweet savor, when you bend, when the priest bends over like that, you can smell the wine. It's very evocative. And it, you know, it's interesting too that at this time we're using the the priest uses the plural. The first prayer, he says, I, I, I. In this one, he says, we. And in fact, at the solemn mass, the deacon is to reach out and hold on to the edge of the chalice and say that prayer with the priest, which probably goes back to a time when old, old bishops didn't get their arms up very easily and chalices could be heavy and they needed a little, 
a little help and maybe their eyesight wasn't so great and memory wasn't so great so they made sure that the deacon said the prayer I assure you Reverend Mr. Racanelli that I know the prayer but you are to say it with me anyway properly please so we have shifted from singular to the plural and then he bends low before the altar touching with his fingers and he says accept O Lord in the, uh, the spirit of humility and contrition of heart and grant that the sacrifice which we offer this day in thy sight may be pleasing to the O Lord our God now, Saint Robert Bellarmine talks about this prayer he says that this in no way reflects any doubt in the priest about what is going to happen uh, I, maybe in his day in our day I'm not so sure Robert Bellarmine ex says that doesn't this does not reflect doubt about what is about to take place it expresses only the priest's doubts about his own disposition he certainly recognizes how unworthy he is so he asks for contrition he asks for sorrow for his sin because of his love for God and love for the flock and so then with a solemn summoning gesture he uses the words from Daniel remember the story of the the, five, the three young men in the fiery furnace they call upon God to save them in that moment come O almighty and eternal God sanctifier and bless the sacrifice prepared for the glory of thy holy name then the insensation of the altar begins and a psalm is recited by the priest sometimes you won't hear that but it's all about again the raising of sacrifice even while we ask God to give the, the priest asks God to give him the grace not to make excuses for his sins and to help him to love as God wants him to love there are so many riches within every word and every gesture whether it's on behalf of the priest or the servers who are serving you know there's an anecdote told about the about the poet Longfellow that he was at one point getting interested in what the Catholic Church taught and then he saw the slack attitude and the negligence of servers at mass once and he he didn't want to have anything to do with it after that this can't be serious on the other hand a great French modern French poet who had been Catholic but fell away from the church found himself in Notre Dame in Paris and he saw the care the great care of the service and he was so moved by it by the sublime beauty of all the gestures and so forth that he reverted he came back to the practice of his faith all of these things teach us about our attitude before the altar of the Lord let none of us come to the Lord like the Pharisee did presumptuous overconfident we have to be the publican we have to think about ourselves lowly hollowed out get confident filled with joy we can't be filled with what God wants to give us unless we've emptied ourselves out first so pray that my sacrifice and yours might be acceptable to God the Almighty Father in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost.